Good afternoon, Anaseo. So today, two topics. One, emotion. I will speak about this emotion. Emotion capture is a method for about 30 minutes. So can you keep me time 30 minutes? And then I will switch to psychophysics and how to apply it to research. That another 30 minutes. So, do we have the word emotion in Korea? Emotion. emotion. The word emotion in Korea. Do we have it? Okay. So, this is always a problem when we study emotion because when I think about the word emotion, I'm from America, I study in English, so we think like the Westerner a little bit. So we think emotion as the Western world, but when we come back, I came back to Thailand and said, we had a problem because I was involved in a dictionary program for Thai people. What, does, what is the Thai word for emotion? And now I ask you, what is the Korean word for word emotion? You actually have a hard time to say it. Now you think about what is actually the meaning of it. We will introduce you today about that one. So today you will learn emotion. What is it? This is in the Western perspective. So there is no definition that in stone yet. But this is what in the research in the Western world actually dealing with. You will learn how to differentiate the word emotion, mood. Do we have the word mood in Korea? Do we have it? Yes, right? Are you sure? <laughs> in Thai, we don't have this word, period. We, we can't say, when we translate English literature, the word emotion and mood is exactly the same word, which is creating a lot of problem in research because the definitions are totally different. And that will be your problem when you do it in Korea. I can't solve it though. I can't speak Korean. Then the word affects and attitudes. These are the four main words that actually in food science and also the product design actually dealing with. Very important and you want to know how to measure them. Today we will, if we have time, I will, I will fly through how to measure emotions because there are so many ways in the world that people actually say that they're measuring emotion. i just introducing you to all those methodologies. And how to study emotion using emocatcher. Emocatcher itself is a protocol how to research it. So the protocol how to research something, you know, you need to know what you're doing, dealing with. You need to know what are you going to do with your data that you're gathering. <laughs> That's fancy word called statistical analysis. Anyone like statistics? You like statistics? I hate it. <laughs> Sometimes you don't need to do it. You can do it qualitatively and quantitatively. And if we finish it by 30 minutes, then we'll move to the next one is about psychophysics. Okay, let's go. We don't have much time. Oh. So what's is emotion. Anyone want to try? What is the definition of emotion? Doctor? <laughs> <laughs> the only English speaker in the room. Do you want to try? Jacob? I'm not an English speaker. <laughs> <laughs> the, oh. <laughs> the one that looks closest to the word. So what is emotion? You can Google them, just Google it, and you will see a lot of definitions out there. There's nothing wrong of Googling. 
but don't publish it and quote Google. No, no. So what is emotion? Let's do this. What do you think about this picture? What do you think about her? And what do you think about him? Why are you laughing? Keep it in mind. Don't tell anyone. What do you think she is happy? Is she happy? What do you think? Who thinks she is happy? Raise the hands up. One, two, three. Three. Who? And anyone else, the other, what do you think? What is she feeling in this situation? A guy sniffing next to her, another hand holding an alcoholic beverage. And what do you think the guy is feeling in this situation? Okay, what, 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 what? What? Oh, you think that way. What, what do you think he is feeling when he's smelling her? I don't know, smell the shoulder or smell the hair. No? What do you think? <laughs> okay, nobody answer, huh? Keep it in your mind. What do you think about her? You know who she is? Who? Who is she? What's her name? Lady Gaga? What do you think she looks like? Confidence? Arrogant? A bitch? Up to you. This is called stimuli. What do you think is what you think. We're going to skip the video because we don't have time. How about this woman? What do you think is her emotional state? Just look at it. What do you think about the rape victim during the time of the rape? What emotion will rise up in her mind? We just have only a picture as a stimuli. What do you think she think about it? Fear? Anger? What is other word? Korean word. I don't know Korean words. <laughs> Petrified. Fancy English word of extremely fear. <laughs> so now, after you see the rape, what do you think she feel? You think she still feel happy? Or she may actually have some fear that, what is he doing, sniffing me? Okay, I will introduce you to the word affect, mood and emotion now. Have you noticed your own mood after you watching those series of pictures? Have you noticed how you change your emotion when I say, oh, beautiful woman, now I get you a Lady Gaga, I get you the red picture, and now the same book picture. That's what makes mood and emotion and effect and attitude different from each other. Effect. Effect means feeling about liking something.
it can be nope, not liking, liking and neutral. That's called affect. Happy, not happy, somewhere there. That's called affect. But you need to have an object of your affection. You have, you're gonna like something. You don't just like nothing. Get it? Mood. Mood is something that you feel for a long time. It's not something that you switch right and back and forth or change to something else right away. The best example for this is a woman university. When you have menstruation, anyone has it, right? I don't. When you have that lingering neck pain and you're like, I'm not in a good mood. Anyone say that? I'm not in a good mood. Anyone ever say that? And it usually lasts longer than three hours. And mood, it actually can last for days. That is the feeling that you call mood. It has to last long. You can be very happy for a long time. That's called mood. You are not switching, changing it. That makes it different from emotion. Emotion is the moment a feeling. At that particular moment, what do you feel? And you can switch based on whatever. The example I gave you in the beginning by just showing, showing you the series of pictures and I'm talking and actually enticing, your mood change, your emotion change. Your mood usually don't. You can be happy Emotion, I feeling happy when you in a bad mood. You anyone cry when you and you laugh when you cry? Ever done that? When you cry, like oh, you in a bad mood. But sometimes people make you laugh right there. You have a happy emotion, and then thirty seconds later you cry again. Mood is something that lasts, the feeling that lasts. For the time that we don't agree, nobody agrees, I say two, three hours minimum. <laughs> That's my word. <laughs> if it lasts longer than three hours, I'm going to def defy it as mood. But emotion is something that you can switch and back and forth, move it, change it at the moment, at that time. And this is very critical when you design experiment. If you want to capture emotion of a product by knowing this definition, which context do you want to put your product in? Are you gonna test the product in a gray looking booth have you do, done that? You have a booth and put a product and people testing it and ask them how much do you like it? Have you guys done that? Hmm? Have you ever changed the booth to have a happy color and ask the same question and you see the score? That is the reason why we do things in the gray booth. Though it's not wrong, but you can, when you get the result from that situation, you can extrapolate to something else. In real life, your product will pass through so many situations. And if you want to capture emotion, you rather know which situation you are going to measure. That's the key 
by knowing the definition of emotion and mood. Emotion is extremely context dependent. Okay? Attitude. What is the word attitude in Korea? Taegu? Taegu. Taegu. So the word attitude in English, <laughs> it means that you have a judgment, good or bad. That's the simple. Liking, sometimes people say is an attitude. The effect is the part of attitude. Attitude, you must have a decision to judge. This thing that you are eating, or the chair that you are sitting, is good or bad. Now the problem is good or bad for whom? Any, uh, any, anyone ever ask that question? Oh, this is good. Good for who? Is it good for myself? Or is good for the world? The reference of good for whom, if it change, you may actually change your attitude. When you face the question, make sure you face it correctly. <laughs> like when I eat ice cream, usually in that context, when we taste the product blind, we say, how, how much do you like it, right? We take for granted that they will assume it's good for them, so I like it. But have you ever studied for someone who thinks they're fat and you take them to take, eat an ice cream and they think they're good for them? It depends on their mood, that they feel good or not. If you're different mood at that time, you did, you did. nothing going to get the high score. <laughs> So, the attitude is the judgment that a person gives it to a stimuli or an object relative to whatever that you want to frame your question. So, you eat bingsu and you say, oh, this is good. So, that's an attitude. Your attitude to what? Bingsu. Now, let me frame it differently. You just got dumb by your boyfriend and you go eat bingsu and crying. Are you going to say, is this good? Why not? Hmm? You in bad mood? She says she not said this is good, but you keep eating it. <laughs> isn't, isn't it conflicting with logic? It's not good, but I keep eating it. Don't blame, the log don't blame yourself, blame the logic. The logic is wrong. The reason for eating bing soup is not because it's delicious. At that moment, the bingsu itself doesn't matter if it's good or bad. It's comforting you. It's the object of the attitude and mood. So when you design your experiment, for example, if you are food scientist, the real scientist, you will put everything in a gray box. Put everything before you're supposed to make them neutral mood. Did you ever do that? No. When you do product testing, you don't just rush people and go into the box. You need to put and sit them down and let them settle to be in a neutral mood before you put them into your product testing. Never do that? Oh. And what did you do? Never consider that? Do it in the future. Before you test a product, 
put people in a neutral mood before you let them into the booth of your product testing. Otherwise, you may actually have a bad data, and nobody in the world can help you fix that. It's just a little detail when you run an experiment. If you want your product to get high score, sit them and watch their favorite movie, and then come and test, and you get high score right away. Is that the scientific testing? No. But if you want for the claim testing, yes, you can do it. Anyone do claim testing? Do you know what the claim is, right? Let me grab an example. Can I get that? Yes. Let me see. Oh, I can't read. <laughs> what do they say? It's like the same chocolate latte. How about these? Oh, it's like fresh chocolate. Fresh chocolate. Fresh. Oh, take it back, take it back. <laughs> when you say something on the package, in this case, you say fresh chocolate. It's a claim. How do you, if I'm a government, how do you define fresh? And you put it on that label to tell my consumer, my naive consumer in Korea to buy your product. This is a national problem. How do you define fresh for the consumer? That's the claim, and you have to test it. You can test it physically, chemically, biochemically, or sensorially. If people test 90, 66%, that's a 95% confidence interval <laughs> level, and say that this chocolate is fresh, then you can put the word on the label. Or you can say that, oh, I go get this within 30 seconds of molding whatever chocolate processing. You can say fresh. That is called claim and you have to have experiment supported, and it can be manipulated by let them watching a happy TV before you go test your product. Uh-oh, did I teach them how to cheat the system? <laughs> okay. Now you get it? What is the difference between emotion, mood, attitude, and affect? That's simple. Get it? Which one is the long one? Mood. Has to linger, the word linger. Emotion can be switched, depends on the stimuli. You can switch, you can cry and laugh at the same time. So that is the dilemma of research. People can have multiple emotions at the same moment. Affect is something about Happy, not happy, like or dislike, or neutral in between. Attitude, you're judging it and it's good or not. You have a judgment. Buy or not buy is an attitude. Like it or dislike it is an attitude. Bad or good is an attitude. The problem is that when the people express the attitude, is what which context they are framing that decision against. And that is always the problem. <laughs> the problem for a company, can we do anything about it? <laughs> yes, you can. You can make money. The entertainer, you know singer? Who is that? 2 p.m., what is the band? Oh, the entertainment is creating emotion and mood. That's why it takes at least an hour for a concert. Have you ever go to concert that lasts for five minutes? Nope. It has to be an hour because they're creating mood. And then when you have a mood, 
And when you get out from the concert, the mood linger. And at that moment, they are selling you the products. Yes. <laughs> but in advertising, advertising that you see in TV or on the board, you have around five seconds <laughs> to actually read it and get react to it. They are not dealing with mood, they're dealing with emotion. Because your stimuli is so short. Advertising in TV it will be what? 10 seconds? If you're driving past in the highway and you see the board and you drive 140 kilometers per hour, you, you think how, how, how long can you watch, can you see that board? Five seconds? And you already passed. That's how people make money. They make money out of those. And now how can we develop a product that capture all those emotions. We're talking about product like this. We are not talking a product that is the entertainer. That's the create mood. Let's see. Emotion, we will teach you how to measure it in your product. So you know what you're dealing with. The code, this is, I think we, I wrote this chapter five years ago. When you make a product, the goal of product development now is not about making people like your product. It's about making people love your product. I'm not talking about branding. Branding is creating mood and emotion at the same time because branding is lasts quite long. You have the brand, but I'm talking about you fall in love and you drink it. That's what I'm talking about. Not just liking it. You need to fall in love with your product. That's how the product can survive in this 21st century. And that's you need to know how to design it and you need to know how to measure it. You can design things, you engineer things, but you don't know what you're engineering. You engineer the physical property, taste and flavor, but what is the impact in the consumer emotion? That's what we are trying to capture for you. So let's go to emo capture. Emo capture. There are four phases, actually five. I put zero in the front. <laughs> When you do research on this, page 26, slice that you are going to be page six. First, before you do anything, you do behavioral and critical incident identification. This is a technical term. Critical incident identification, I, bought, I took it from the sociology. Before you do emotion, you need to figure out what situation that emotion occur most often among your target consumer. Get it? Give you an example. Anyone use perfume? Perfume, use it? Use it? You know, have you anyone interviewed the people who use perfume? No? Why they use perfume? No? Have anyone asked yourself why are you using perfume or cologne? So you smell good? I disagree. I think you feel confident. Why do you want to smell good? It's not about you liking it. It's about people around you liking you. Now, there you answer your own question. So if I ask you, how much do you like the perfume? Does it any answer 
her main objective of using perfume? No, but people still keep asking how much do you like this perfume in the industry? He's thinking. <laughs> you look like you're thinking. <laughs> Have you ever asked that question? You know Avon is the largest perfume seller in the world. Avon sell perfume the most in the world. Don't talk about Chanel. Chanel is this little. The one that Chanel number five, or whatever Hermes is this so little market share. The one that sells perfume the most is Avon <laughs> in the world. When it's moved, when, when I open the call, I want, we're going to develop new perfume. All the big guys in the industry will be like, hello. <laughs> because the volume itself is so big. But the problem is that, oh, it's already 30 minutes. That when you identify here, it's very important. The critical incident identification of your product, behavior, the real reason why. If you don't start with that, the rest of your test will be garbage because you're asking wrong questions. Even though I get Nobel Prize in statistics, I cannot help you to salvage the data. The second phase will be overall experience probing. That's how I get to the point because I did that interview before. When people use a product, is this for themselves, really? Or is this for someone else, based on that situation that you identify? Then you identify the emotion. Now you get the situation, you get the goal of the use, you will be able to identify the emotion. Then you identify the antecedent. What caused that emotion to happen? The third step is developing the appraisal process. This is a new theory, not new anymore actually. It's the current theory about emotion. People have emotion when they actually judge something that meet their goal, your goal. And if it doesn't meet the goal, you will feel negative, oh, affect. If it meet your goal, you will feel happy. But it depends on the importance of the goal. If it, the goal is not that important, you may say, oh, no emotion means you have emotion, mean no emotion. You get that word? I have no emotion, it means you have an emotion, they call neutral. But for the same word in Thailand, if I say I have no opinion, it means negative. This is culture, cultural base, so you need to get that right. Once you get the appraisal process done, you go to behavioral coping and potential probing. It means that if someone uses a product, this is very important, and the product fails to answer the goal, you get the negative emotion, how the person cope with it. And that will identify your competitor. <laughs> if you use a perfume and you spray it on, you like it, and the people around you start coughing and not coming near you at all. Now, the person will say, oh, this product sucks, even though they like it. <laughs> How does the people cope with this situation? Will she buy a new one? Or will she get another perfume on top of it? Or she say, I don't care about the rest. I use it for myself. Those people have, those people, they do exist. I don't care. That's, you need to identify. So once you identify, identify all these steps, then you get the complete map of that emotional state. And only 30 minutes. So, I will skip to the example, to this one. First, to do emotion, you must have stimuli 
or stimulus. If you are the one who producing water, this is the stimulus. You can put the brand on it, you can put the price on it, it doesn't matter, it depends on your objective. If you are not the branding department, you just R&D, you deal with the water. But if you are the brand manage management, you may actually deal with the package and the label and everything. But in the real life, you deal with everything because you don't have enough people. <laughs> so you can, the stimuli, you have to identify and prepare. It can be a word or it can be a video or can be a brand or can be a product, doesn't matter. And then you have to have a way to capture emotion. This is very interesting. But before you do that, you need to ask your question here. How do you get the data? That's when you measure it and the measurement level. You need to know that before you actually get the data. Some people think they get the data that is so uh, interval level and actually is the rank order. <laughs> you will deal with the data wrong. In the qualitative study, you can interview or probing or observe and judging. There are two ways to do qualitative, usually. One, you go talk to a person. The second one, you don't do anything at all, you just sit and look. And the one that I recommend first is to sit and look. The cheapest one. <laughs> Go sit and look. And you will see behavior. When you go start talking, you will start getting their judgment or attitude. There are different parts of the information. You can use another technique, for example, free elicitation technique. Have everyone use it? Technique, this technique is quite useful in the real world. For example, I ask you to test a cup of coffee, give me five words that pop up in your head. That's called free elicitation. <laughs> Recommend five words. Three words is not enough, I try. <laughs> See this? Look. Or you can do recall that story, telling what if, write a diary or blocking. Anyone do blocking? You can do that as a research tool. Observe and judging, that is you just go there and sit and you observe and judge. <laughs> okay, we will run out of time soon. So another tool that people actually try to quantify. Quantify is that you start to measure something in numerical level. Not in numerical, is, numerical is the wrong word. You can get some degree of intensity out of it. So you can have from explicit to the left to implicit to the right. Implicit is that the person that you are measuring doesn't even express anything. They just be there, be the person, and be you measuring it, they don't even know it. This one, people use it a lot. Let's see. First one that people try to use the most, eye tracking. It's actually not really capture emotion that much. It capture attention that closer to attitude. So if people say eye tracking is emotion, it has a little link, but it's not real emotion, but it has a part. Another one is electroencephalography. <laughs> I can't really pronounce this word. ECG, EEG, measuring your brain wave. And then the doctors say that they, they can dig out which link is happy which one is unhappy. Another one that is out there is actually measuring skin conductivity, EKG. This is the instrument. 
you put it there and you go live your life and when you're happy it, the electricity will spike up and you're exciting or when you get mad or you get bored the electricity go down that's their theory behind it surprisingly they do have that kind of theory see that and they send it wirelessly to your machine that's how you capture them there are many ways of it and they even link it with the word the one that actually has been accepted to measuring state of my fear, happy emotion is pupillometry. You measuring how big is your eyeball, what <laughs> iris is open. That is the only one that actually has been proven and validated. The other hasn't that well validated. So you, but it's work with the fear the most, neutral and fear. The happy one doesn't work well. FMRI, they actually scan your brain and see how it's lit up and turn red in certain place. And they say, oh, if it, this is happy, this is happy region. So this is the intensity of the redness that they're going to use as your measurement. So this is happy. That's how your brain looks happy. And this is how your brain sad. And they say that everybody will have this pattern. And some company will actually put everything together. And you will look like that when you do the testing. Another one is the facial analysis. This is based on Paul Ekman study. That's people actually innate moving of the muscle, reflecting a certain emotion. And he quantifies his life work. And it worked quite OK. But it's quite basic emotions that is actually giving you. So there is a, in Vladikin? No, Vekanikin. Is, what is that? Vekanikin, that they have the restaurant that map your face when you eat. There is a machine doing that. You don't need to do it by hand anymore. OK, another one that people use the most is using scales. This is Primo's. The inside is the Jennifer, Geneva emotional wheel. So we most likely to use this technique most often. These are explicit. It means I give you what I feel. I'm saying it. Not I'm just sitting there and you say that what I feel. That's implicit. So this is essence profile. You can do check out that apply. Eat this ice cream. What do you feel? Check, 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 check. As quick as you can. <laughs> Another one actually in psychology use is called my reading. It's the facial feature of, of emotion. Your, your scale is these faces. And you pick one that reflects you the most. This is Essence, Primo's. I'm going to jump over this. The Emo Catcher actually analyzes two things. One is which emotion will most likely occur and cover the range of the people the most. So if you do Check out that apply for 100 people eating the same ice cream. You want to identify emotion that hap happen commonly the most. That, te that analysis technique, you use tough analysis. Anyone done that? It's not new analysis. It will tell you how much, how many people, how many people in percent, if you include this emotion. And if you have these five emotions show up and say that 100% of people will feel, one of them will feel this, that's it means you capture five most important emotions that has the most reach to your consumer. That's very powerful because when you communicate, you can communicate maximum three. And after you do that reach, another one is that you run the, a network analysis. Network analysis is that if I want something that happy, 
which word that people choose next to it may be the word delicious. You get me? If, you, if I ask you, I have the list of words, and you taste my ice cream, say, oh, happy, delicious. It means these two words are linked. One will lead to the other. How important is that? It means that if you cannot say the word happy, you have an option what to say. And you can identify the most direct words that you want to communicate to consumer about your product. Let, let's go to the example. This is example, real example, from Korean study. Go Shu Chang. 180 Chinese consumer in China interview about Go Shu Chang. Use the one-on-one -on -one interview mode, free word association. Which means that when you see this, what do you think? Tell me. That is all we did. After that, you get the word of faces and we, anal we break them down and analyze it. We found that 100 something people used 79 words. So it means that they re repeat. 180 consumers use only 79 words when you see picture of this Koshujang. And these are the words. Then, when you count the frequency, they say that that Koshujang represents spicy and taste. Yeah, it's useful to me, huh? <laughs> but, if you actually run turf analysis, Try to find the five most words that will reach 90% of the consumer, you get five sets. You can use whatever in this set. And this, if you have this word in your advertising, you will catch the eye of 90% of the consumer about Go Shujang. Just put that five thing, that six words somewhere in your advertisement. And then if you analyze those 79 words, you will get the link. And these are the five words that identify. And these are the link. The stronger they link to each other, the thicker the line. And if you want something else to be used, you look at the one that adjacent. We have the direct line next to it. For example, you can extract this group. And you can see that we can use that word a little bit, or we can use this word. It allows you to identify the options of the words. You see, if we talk about this word, you can actually use these words to try to get there. Or if your objective of your advertisement is this certain word, you must make people believe that you have this word because it will be the first direct link. So that's when you do that, we have the core word about Kochujang is taste spicy kimchi cabbage in Korea. This is for Chinese people. When you want to have rich more, you put these five more words in it on picture. And if you want to have a compliment word, you need to communicate about this. Kimchi fried rice, kimchi pancake, kimchi noodle. So if you want to create an image that communicates gochujang, you need to have this kind of food on the poster. If you have something else, people are not going to link it. They don't think about something else. Even though it's a very cool food somewhere in Gangnam. I'm talking about the whole country in China. So they know Gochujang through kimchi fried rice. If you want to communicate Gochujang to Chinese, kimchi fried rice. And that will link you to, with the red color, something that looks tasteful, sour, bibimbap, it's good. You will communicate that and you get that attention. OK? We will run out of time for, how can I get out of here? There for that.
So if you use essence profile, which is an emotion capturing method, you can run the same analysis and you get the same network. Okay, which one you want? See that coffee or milk? Which one you want to know? I do. This one. View. Is that a full, this one? There. Okay, I'm done with the emotion. I can read Korean. <laughs> you have any question? What I want you to know is the difference between emotion, mood, attitude, and affect. That's the four key. Next one is how we apply psychophysics. Anyone know psychophysics, right? Did you teach them? In different class. Psychophysics is the basic of sensory science. If you want to know why your scale, nine point hedonic scale, triangle test, what develop is developed from psychophysics. It's very important. Our marketing research actually developed from psychophysics, but it split from psychophysics in 1970s. They split the line got split and they developed the whole field called market research, the decision-making field. But this one, I will apply psychophysics in the real world. The goal is to reduce sugar in skim chocolate milk. How much sugar is sweet enough? This is for American consumer. The most sold milk product in America is skim chocolate milk. The problem in America, we found that they're obese, they're fat. 66% of Americans are obese, which means it's a pandemic. Now, the government say, reduce the sugar, and we will reduce your tax. So all the company want to reduce sugar, but they're afraid that if we reduce sugar, Will our consumer will like it or not? So the question is, how much can you do? It doesn't. I can stand here. Oh, did I do the long function? Yeah, it's right there. So in basic psychophysics, that you do, you do threshold. In threshold test, this is will tell you how much of a product is there for you to know that is there. They call detection threshold. Another one is that how much is it there for you to know that is sweet? That called recognition threshold. That's one thing. We talk about detection. That is the threshold problem in psychophysics. Another one is discrimination problem, and the world expert is here. <laughs> Ask her. <laughs> she is expert in discriminating our methodology. And we deal with recognition. Most of the time that you run the study in your field right now is the scaling problem. What does it mean, the scale, how it's measured? What level of information you get from using that scale? The problem is that all this, most of the psychophysics study that has been done is done in the model system. So when we decided to do this, we go back and look, how much sugar can we do? What is the threshold of sugar, sucrose? It ends up with our research done in water. Can that number help me as the milk producer to reduce sugar in chocolate milk? Not plain milk, chocolate milk. It doesn't help, so it has to be done again. This kind of study, you've done it once in your lifetime, and that's it. The most important study I've seen is the study run by physicists that identify what wavelength you see what color. Have you know that? 
the visible wavelength of light. Without that study, you have no color TV. That's the psychophysic work. You run it once in your lifetime, and that information usually is very general. So in this study, we actually, I don't, I'm going to skip this. We don't have enough time for that, sensation to behavior. Try to answer the question, how much sugar can be reduced in skim milk without significantly impacting consumer liking? This question has two things. One, how much can be reduced? Two, reduce it and they still like it. Two questions in one statement. And you use different psychophysical study. The first one, how much can you reduce? It ends up that how much do you need to add sugar for them to detect that there is there. That's detection threshold question. Then how much concentration of sugar in chocolate milk or skim milk that you have to put in order for people to feel that it's sweet. That break cognition threshold question. After that, you need to develop a power function for sugar, this one we use sucrose in different type of fat level for chocolate milk. I forgot to change that. It means and. That's a tie. <laughs> the power function is uh, another psychophysical function that works when you have recognition threshold level and above. Not confusable level. It will not work. Once you have power function, you can identify the ISO sweetness level. Now you can identify the level of sugar that have the same sweetness equivalent to whatever other kind of sweetener you use. This one, you done it, people are going to be so happy. If you want to change it to sucralose, you want it to be corn fructose, uh, fructose corn syrup, the information you generate here. And you, it will tell you that if you put sucrose this much, how much you should be in fructose, for example, but in the chocolate milk as a media, not water. After that, we identify the liking level of the sugar-reduced product and see that how it's compared against the commercial product. Will it be OK? This one they call preference threshold work. How much you can reduce something that people still like it, or how much you can add something that people still like it, and the liking doesn't go down. Certain things you can add so much, the liking is still going up or plateau, like vanilla and chocolate itself. Let's see. What we get is this detection and recognition threshold for sucrose in different media. Water, whole milk, skim milk, skim chocolate milk. This is what we are interested in. But we, when we did this research, we did the whole thing. This is the impact of the fat content in the milk, how it's reduced. The threshold, the more, is mean that you need to add more product. It's found that the low Skim chocolate milk, you need to add 17.14 millimolar of sucrose in order for them to recognize that your chocolate milk is sweet. So it means that when you add sucrose in your chocolate milk, you need, add, you need to add at least this much. Now the question is, how much will you make people like it and will not be as much as the current product? So we actually construct the power function to answer those. And this is the exponent. Exponent is the slope of this line. See that? So if you want to ask skim chocolate milk that has the same level of sweetness in water, you need to add more. But if you do only skim milk, we add a little bit less, closer to water. The data is more, I just show you only three. Now, after that, 
From there, we actually select the concentration for testing. And we found that sucrose concentration that you want to reduce, to add, and we'll get quite equivalent liking is at 142.2. The level of sucrose in the commercial chocolate milk is 205. It means that people actually in America has been adding sugar, sugar 30% more than it necessary in chocolate milk. Talk another way, you can reduce sugar by 30%. You still have the same liking in chocolate milk. So is it answer the objective of the question? How much can you do that? But in the liking arena, you don't do overall liking for everyone because chocolate milk, who is the, buy, the person who buys chocolate milk? The mother. Who drink the chocolate milk? The kids. If the kids doesn't like it, the mother will not buy it. If the mother doesn't like it, the mother will not buy it. <laughs> so when you run consumer study, you need to know. So we actually measuring the kids in two different age, and the one before you is adult, is the mother. And find the level of the liking that they're OK with it. And you be in, in a bit 140 millimolar of sucrose, it will be fine when the current commercial level is 205. Pretty much American industry has been sweetened their population for 20 years by adding sugar, sugar into their, their children's chocolate milk, and they complain that they're obese. I'm not surprising. So the conclusion from this study is that we recommend to reduce sugar content from 205 millimolar to 250 millimolar. You can reduce quite a lot, which around 21 to 31% 30, of sucrose reduced. For adults, it's OK. For children, it's acceptable. For children younger, it's actually OK. So that is the recommendation for the government to use. If you are industry, you can reduce it to 105 and 50 millimolar. Now, this number will give them how to deal with the market. If I'm the company, I'm not going to reduce from 205 to 150 millimolar right away. I may actually this year reduce it 190. The next year, I reduce it to 150. <laughs> That's up to the company to do. That is the strategy how to deal with the market, not the research question anymore. This one was done with Mary Ann Drake in the US, and Dr. Sing Ming Lee, I think she graduated. <laughs> OK, I think I ran out of time, unless you want to know about civet coffee. She said you need to stop. <laughs> <laughs>